most of the studies of romantic love have focused on monogamous heterosexual love. The formal study of love and desire and attachment goes back to the early 1900s. We now have neuroimaging studies to support, for instance, the work of, of Alan Shore from UCLA, showing that when a mother and child interact, brain of the child and the brain of the mother are entering a coordinated state of relaxation. We can have many different kinds of loves. There's romantic love. There's love of family, so-called familial love. There's love of pets. We can even love objects. Most of the studies of romantic love have focused on monogamous heterosexual love. And also, when we talk about studies focused on desire and attractiveness and attachment, that's also the case. And that simply reflects the general bias of the literature over the last 50 to 100 years. The formal study of love and desire and attachment goes back to the early 1900s. One of the classic studies on this is entitled Love and Desire. It was published in 1912 and really focused on two opposing themes within romance. One is love, which in that paper was really meant to include attachment and dependence or interdependence between individuals, right? And the other end of the spectrum being desire or the sexual desire for another. When I started graduate school, the chairman of the department I was in at the time said to me, you know, most PhDs last longer than most marriages. And indeed he was right. And also, most marriages in this country end in divorce. I think it's about 50% with a slight skew toward more ending in divorce than um, persist until death do them part. But nonetheless, it's about half and most marriages end before the eight year period is up. There's something about our attachment machinery that can be very, very compelling such that people take on tremendous levels of commitment. I have to imagine that most people enter marriages assuming that they're going to stay in those marriages. I don't think most people enter marriages thinking they're going to get divorced. But that if 50% of those commitments end in divorce, there must also be mechanisms by which our attachments can break. We are relatively hardwired for attachment. I think that that's incredible and beautiful that we have designated neurons, nerve cells, and hormonal systems that are there to ensure that we have some sort of response to a caregiver being there or not being there or returning or leaving, but also that the same neural circuitries, the same hormonal responses are at least in some way repurposed for entirely different types of attachments later in life. We now have neuroimaging studies to support for instance, the work of, of Alan Shore from UCLA showing that when a mother and child interact, either through very soothing interactions like bottle feeding or breastfeeding or singing to one's baby or putting them to sleep, that the brain of the child and the brain of the mother are entering a coordinated state of relaxation. When the mother or other caregiver acts very excited and raises the, their voice or puts a lilt in their voice or widens their eyes, that the child will do the same. And again, there's a bi-directional interaction in that case of excitement. And there's the release of neurochemicals like dopamine into the bloodstream. Whereas in the relaxation scenario and the soothing scenario, there's we know the, the release of things like serotonin and oxytocin. Our nervous system is tethered to the nervous systems of others. And that is true from the very earliest stages of our lives. And in this case, we're talking about how our templates for attachment in romantic relationships, how we find them, how we maintain them, and indeed how we break them and reform them, is based on a template that was established through an entirely different set of priorities, which was how we feel safe and secure in novel environments, depending on whether or not our primary caregiver is there or not. People that have an anxious ambivalent or what we would call an insecure attachment style, or for people that fall into the disorganized or disoriented attachment style, how they can modify that attachment style in or out of relationships in order to establish what I think everybody wants, which is secure attachment. Why does everybody want that? Well, secure attachment allows people to be both in relationship or if they choose to be on their own or to be in relationship but physically separated from somebody else or even emotionally separated from somebody else. Is there a goal in all of this stuff about 
love, desire, and attachment? I- indeed, there is. The, the secure attachment style is the one that leads to the most stable and predictable long-term relationships. Put differently, babies, toddlers, adolescents, teens, and young adults that have a secure attachment style are more likely to find and form long-term relationships than are people in the other categories. So if I were to offer a set of tools around these topics of desire, love, and attachment, I would say, first of all, you might want to think about whether or not you fall into the secure, insecure, or other um, attachment styles. Second, I think it is vitally important for all of us, but certainly for people that are in relationships or seeking relationships, to be able to at least have some recognition of where our autonomic nervous system tends to reside, both in terms of when we are with somebody and when they leave. In love and attachment, we tend to put so much value in the other that we forget that many of the processes that are going on in our brain and body actually could be evoked by many other people too. But I think it somewhat overlooks the enormous power of attachment and the ways in which somebody's smell, somebody's voice, somebody's um, everything, or somebody's particular thing or things can really become so vital for our autonomic nervous system to feel soothed and to feel elated, etc. Positive dilution is critical. If you look at the stability of relationships over time, something that's been extensively studied mainly by psychologists, but now also by neurobiologists, what you find is that there are some key features of interactions between individuals that predict that a relationship will last. There are some interesting studies involving, again, neuroimaging and some subjective measures in humans, meaning asking them questions that um, they're good ways to tease out lies from truths in, in these sorts of studies. And whether or not people tend to find their partner or others more or less attractive depending on how people feel about themselves.